of all people. Support. Who do you want when that door closes to be sitting behind that desk to fight for women's rights? I have been the fiercest advocate Senator. for women's reproductive freedom Senator, for over fine. a decade. I would pass a $1,000 freedom dividend for every American adult starting at age 18, which would speed us up on climate change because if you get the boot off of people's throats, they'll okay. focus on climate change much more clearly. Governor. We must be a country who loves our children more than we love our guns. If more guns made us safer, we'd be the safest country on earth. It doesn't work that way. Here to help me dive into all of those issues we heard tonight on the debate stage, we've got Nancy Santiago, Vice President of Hispanics and Philanthropy, and Philanthropy, Politico's Alex Thompson, MSNBC political analyst Zerlina Maxwell. Who do you think won the debate tonight, Alex? Oh, it was Kamala Harris. And that exchange that she had with Vice President Biden is going to be the moment that's remembered in this debate. It's also one of the most substantive disagreements, debates on race and civil rights that we've ever seen in a presidential debate. And it's not even over because Kamala's campaign is already saying Biden needs to apologize for his past positions on busing. And there's an open question. Biden in there defended his past views that the Department of Education should not go in and enforce busing. That's not clear. That's plausible for this modern day Democratic Party. And they're going to keep pushing him to apologize and change his position. Do you think he was right, Zerlina, to double down when she held his feet to the fire? No, he was absolutely wrong. He's wrong. And, and she articulated fundamentally, I think, a really important debate in the Democratic Party, which is the role of the federal government when it steps in, when states are not doing um, what the Supreme Court says it should do, right? The federal government is the only entity big enough and strong enough to come in and say, no, you're going to admit mm -hmm. these schools in, and integrate schools. And so her point on the substance is correct. So he was absolutely wrong in that moment and wrong to double down. And Nancy, you were there last night in Miami, correct? That's right. One thing I could not help but notice was the way that identity politics was treated tonight versus last night. To me, and tell me if I'm wrong, it felt like last night was more about who I am. And tonight was more about what I've experienced. You saw the candidates connect on things like health care, saying, look, I've had a sick dad or I've had a terminal illness. And it seemed to be about the marrow of their experiences. Do you think that affected why that moment with Kamala was so powerful? Well, I don't think it was that per se for me, having been in the audience, because there was some identity politics last night. And it was really around the immigration piece. Mm -hmm. It's not black and white. Right. This is a very different thing. So in that respect, there was some and that was a little heated exchange between Beto and Julian Castro. Right. And so if you think about that piece, it just played out differently. What I think the problem or the, the missed opportunity for Biden was that he had a chance to model for America how to say, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. let's fix this. Because she said, I was hurt mm -hmm. personally. That was his moment yeah. to show America how you do come together to show America how you bridge that. Because he said it, I'm the bridge. Well, then do that. And that didn't happen in the exchange with Kamala. I think she spoke for other black people, too. That's because I That's think right. saying that it was hurtful, it's not saying that, like, we need to have a march on Washington to protest Joe Biden, right? I mean, that we're just saying that, you know, your words had an impact in a negative way because it seemed like you didn't understand what you were saying in the moment. You were complimenting, not praising specifically, to be clear, but, but saying something complimentary about segregationists seems like something you should not say as a Democrat who wants to, to win the nomination. And speaking of that, what I think was so powerful was when she said, hey, I do not think you're a racist. Mm -hmm. Because for any of us who mm -hmm. are out in the field, we hear that word being thrown mm -hmm. around, being used just because you voted for Trump, automatically you're a racist, automatically this. And to, to say very plainly, hey, I think I believe I know what's in your heart. But this is an issue about policy, and that's why we're all standing here on the debate stage. Do you think, however, that she's keeping this issue around? She, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. she said the word praise, mm -hmm. praising the segregationists, yeah. which he didn't. He no. said I, he didn't do. To be clear, and he, he said didn't do he that. Didn't do that. Yeah. Do you think she and even uh, Senator Booker are keeping this issue alive for political reasons? Sure. Think, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes. Alex is like, okay, yes. okay. It's a debate. They yeah. both want to be president. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only one of them can be president. Yeah. She's going to prosecute that case. That doesn't mean that the feelings aren't sincere. Right. And right. that she wasn't offended and that she right. wasn't hurt. But she's going to keep pushing this because she wants to show that she can not only prosecute the case against Trump, She's going to prosecute the case against the frontrunner right now and prove that she can take him down. I think that's what tonight was about for her. She's Speaking on the about stage looking like somebody who wanted to win the election, she's that's not. Right. She didn't come in tonight just to you know go up in the polls a little bit. She 
came out tonight with the conviction. I mean, it was almost like in the eyes. She had conviction. She looked directly into the camera at the American people and, and said things, you know, with such confidence when I'm president when I'm in the she Oval will hold office. the mic in her hand right I mean th those are that it's subtle but uh, you know I I don't know if you feel this way as well but you know Carol Mosley Braun in 2004 obviously participated the in the debate first African, first African American, 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 American woman female, so um right. I have not I didn't watch that the was debate. the 90s right and I, and I didn't watch the debate um this is the first time in my you know adult life I've seen a black woman on but let's just make like sure this. we pause for our audience here yes. so Senator Harris is Correct. the first African-American yes. female senator but back in the day in the 90s yes. this is who was, yes. was at the debate so, stage so we from we've, Illinois there are three black women total that have ever run um but this is the first time in my adult life I've seen a black woman on stage at this level and to see them show up and not just be happy to be there and be participating that they're taking it to the front not just the front runner, but the former vice president, to the first black president, I think that she's going to win over a lot of fans who, um, again, going back to the AP poll I cited at the beginning, she's the number one on the list of people who want to learn more about her. So, Nancy, I have to get you to weigh on, uh, in on this for me. Why was that moment with Kamala tonight read so differently than that moment with Beto yesterday, cuando estaba hablando español, when he was speaking <laughs> Spanish? Right. It's one of those moments we've been using the word appropriation quite a bit. It was that moment of, come on, <laughs> not here. Let's not do this right now. But this is the, this have. is broadcast on Telemundo, para que la gente sepa, so that everyone exactly. knows it que había gente moment. Latino, there were people, Latino people in the audience. So he was speaking Spanish also to Absolutely. a Latino audience. But it was one of those moments, what we saw happen in Julian, and mind you, Julian had nothing to lose last night. It was yeah. one, he had everything yeah. to gain. That fire in the belly mm -hmm. came out, yeah. and I think, Beto really dragged it out of him with that moment because he's like, let's not go there because we're going to talk about this, yeah. not with some cute Spanish, but what, what it really is. Mm -hmm. And here are the policies that you're not answering to, that you're not talking about how you're going to change. And again, no one tonight mentioned 1325. Right. Everything Only Julian happening. did yesterday. That's right. And nothing happened today. And what we're still And we're in 1325 for our audience, yeah, asylum, right. just they understand what Well, it's 1325 is what makes it right. illegal to get across a border without a document, mm -hmm. right? That's what makes it illegal. It could be a civil offense. It doesn't have to be a criminal one. Right. But this is this is the struggle. So that right there is what's causing it. And make no mistake about it, nobody brought up the raids that are pending. Mm -hmm. The city of Philadelphia, my hometown, is about to be one of the largest staging sites for what we will see again as family deportations. And they're coming. No one brought it up. So I think what happened is, you know, speaking Spanish is nice. Doing something mm. matters. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that's what I think really got in his crawl last night. And that's what we saw come out. There was a fire in the belly that I have mm. never seen that I was incredibly excited to see last night. And then when you see everybody kind of Googling him, like, where did he come from? I think we're going to have the same reaction to Senator Harris tonight, although many more people know who she is. But there was a different Mm -hmm. senator that was on that stage tonight. Well, we did she just find points. out that in terms of Google searches, the Google search for Kamala Harris increased by 500 percent tonight mm -hmm. since the debate began, and she was the top search among all of the candidates. But one candidate we did not speak about, interestingly, in this post-debate show, but we were speaking about in the pre-debate show, was Senator Sanders. Yeah. So what happened? Did he hurt or did he help his lead tonight? Well, he clearly came in not wanting to engage Biden. There was all the speculation that he was going to take on Biden. And even on one of the signature issues, really a layup for Bernie about the Iraq war vote in 2003, where Bernie was in the Congress and voted the opposite way. He mentioned it, showed that they disagreed, and then moved on to other issues. He clearly didn't want to get in a jousting match with Biden. Was he scared? We'd have to, we should ask him. I think well, it was a strategic <laughs> calculation, though. Yeah. I think he came in there ready to to back down and to stick to his issues, talk about Medicare for all, and not try to get in a slugging match with Biden. Alex, speaking of asking the candidates, I want to do just that right now with NBC's very own Von Hilliard. He is there in Miami in the spin room. Von, who have you been able to talk to tonight? Oh, I see the cameras moving. Senator, going to pull There he is. He's pulling over Senator Bennett. Okay, Von. Two senators to your left there, to your right there on the stage. Senator Bernie Sanders and Senator Kamala Harris, and they raised their hands when they said, talked about eliminating private health insurance. From your experience in the Senate and from working on such legislation, what is it that they're missing in this equation here? 
Well, I think what they're missing, first of all, they were honest about what's in the bill, which is good because there are some people who say that it doesn't eliminate private insurance, that it's somehow like Australia's system, which I think is a good system where you have both private and public insurance. So that's point one, credit for honesty. Second, I think what they're missing is that there are a lot of people in America, as Bernie said tonight, there are a lot of people that hate private insurance, and that's true. I hear from a lot of people like that. There are also a lot of people that like the insurance that they have and want to keep it. And I think if the objective is getting to universal health care coverage as quickly as we can, giving people an option to choose for their family, I think is absolutely going to be the fastest way. I think we will be dead before we take it away from people that are holding it um, uh, at their homes or uh, with their families, and, and that's why I just don't think it'll work. The question is, totally there, there was a surprise when Senator Harris raised her hand to that response there, and I think there's a concern among a lot of people that what impact does that have in a general election? Well, first can you of make all, a, can I, you make a I wasn't surprised because I think she's for it, and she has said that she wants it. I think that in states uh, like Colorado and other states where uh, that we need to win the majority in the Senate, um, we're going to have a hard time if the if the position of the Democratic Party is we're going to take insurance away from 180 million people. Remember what was what happened after the Affordable Care Act. President Obama said, if you like your insurance, you can keep it. A s relatively small number of people lost it because of the way the, the the system came into place, and and that was a political disaster, and it continues to be one today. So imagine a, a situation where what we're saying to people is, if you like your insurance. Uh, we're going to take it away from you. That doesn't seem to be what we should be arguing. What we should be arguing is for universal health care coverage. And we can achieve that through a public option, and I think we can achieve it quickly and with much less disruption. And by the way, everybody who has private insurance and who hates it no longer needs it because they can come on to Medicare X. One last question for you. There was the conversation about passing the torch to a next generation. Do you believe that two men in the middle of the uh, middle of that stage should pass that I torch? I think it's time. I mean, I'd answer Bernie's question that he asked at the very end by saying, look, yeah, it's true. Forty years of economic uh, immobility in this country, and we haven't figured out how to address it. I think it's time for a new generation of leadership in the country. I agree with that. Senator Michael Bennett. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for it. having me. Thank Good you. to see you. Vaughn, does Senator Bennett, did, does he consider himself part of this new generation of leadership? Vaughn, okay, okay I think Vaughn, we, we lost him to the spin room, which is where he ought to be, getting more answers from those candidates. NBC's Vaughn Hillier, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for watching. Stay tuned because we're just going to take a very short break. We'll be right here with special coverage of the first presidential debate on NBC News Now. Stay tuned. Thanks for so much for joining us here on NBC News Now. And one of the big issues that the candidates hit early was their plans for health care. We also heard a lot about that from candidate Stalwell, who is now talking to NBC's Von Hilliard. Von Hilliard, let us know what Stalwell said. Let's go ahead and talk to him. He's there right behind you. I want to specifically ask about the question he placed to Joe Biden about torchbearers. Can we ask about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Congressman Swalwell, Morgan, the question right off the top was essentially the idea of passing the torch. Why come right off the top with that as being the question to Vice President Biden? There's an urgency to the issues that this generation faces. Student loan debt. I have it. 40 million others have it. It's persisted for the last 40 years. We need someone who's going to do something now. Gun violence. Send my kids to school and worry about their safety. So many millions of Americans do as well. We can't wait for any, anyone else to evolve on this issue. We need someone who understands the immediacy to act. And third, on climate, we can't have a middle-of-the-road strategy on this. The urgency to act means that we have to invest immediately in a Green New Deal type of plan. And so, you know, Joe Biden was right 32 years ago when he said it's time to pass the torch to a new generation of leaders. I'm standing on that stage as someone who's ready to receive that torch. Could you not make the argument that Vice President Biden or Bernie Sanders have had that experience and have had that history, though, that lends them credibility at this moment in time to make the case as to what policies you know, to you press forward? Deep respect for Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden. I just happen to think that these issues are so urgent that we can't count on people who've been around for dozens of decades uh, as these problems have still persisted. We need new eyes 
experience on this problem set, new energy to solve them, and I'm, I'm ready to do that. So the, so the question is, there's 20 people on this yeah. debate stage. You're not the only one in yeah. your generation, yeah. if I may. Why you among the generation that includes uh, Senator Kamala Harris and Mayor yeah. Pete Buttigieg? Well, I'd say I'm day one ready. I've been in Congress for seven years, and I've shaped Washington more than it's shaped me. I've led a group effort to bring more young members to Congress. We have over 50 members in their 40s and under, so I see a moment to seize. But I'm also on the House Intelligence Committee, Vaughn. one of only three people in the House that has the deepest access to the Mueller report. I yeah. know the threat this president is to our country. I'll be ready to lead on day one. I'm going to pass along a question to you from Morgan. Morgan, Vaughn, what do you I got? want to ask a question for Mr. Saulwell there. One of the audience members on Twitter said that the torchbearers have not earned the trust of the people yet. Why does he think that the younger generation and that the American electorate should trust him as that torchbearer? There are some folks that have suggested that uh, this younger generation has not earned the trust yet in order to have that torch be passed, especially when they are in the roles that they are and still have uh, much credibility to their names. Have, in what way have you earned that trust? Why, why, why should people actually trust you? Yeah. I went to Congress at 31 years old and I saw a lot of millionaires, a lot of people disconnected, and so I went right to work. No freshman Democrat passed more legislation in the minority than I did my freshman year. I'm on the House Intelligence Committee. I've gone to the war zones. I've met with foreign leaders. I've taken classified briefings. I, only Senator Harris and I on that stage have access to the most amount of classified information today. So I'm ready day one to lead this country. So then why not Senator Harris? Well, I, I'm a big fan of Senator Harris. I think we bring different experiences. Uh, for me, I bring working class background, born in Iowa, educated in the South, married to a Hoosier, elected in a diverse part of California. I know this country and I can represent it and beat Donald Trump. Congressman Swallow, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks, it. Yeah. Morgan? Congressman Swallow, thank you so much. And Von Hilliard, thank you. Please stay in the spin room. We'd love to come back to you a little bit later. Again, that was NBC's Von Hilliard. And as you just heard from Congressman Swalwell, one of the big issues that the candidates hit early was their plans for health care, from Obamacare to Medicare for all, covering undocumented immigrants and doing away with private health plans. Everything was on the table tonight, and the candidates got right into it. Take a look. Who here would abolish their private health insurance in favor of a government-run plan? Yeah. All right. When uh, my wife and daughter were killed in an automobile accident, my two boys were really very badly injured. I couldn't imagine what it would be like if I had not had adequate health care available immediately. And then when my son came home from Iraq after a year, he was diagnosed with terminal cancer, and uh, he was given months to live. I can't fathom what would have happened if, in fact, they said, by the way, the last six months of your life, you're on your own. We're cutting off. You've used up your time. The fact of the matter is that the quickest, fastest way to do it is build on Obamacare. We will have Medicare for all when tens of millions of people are prepared to stand up and tell the insurance companies and the drug companies that their day is gone, that health care is a human right, not something to make huge profits off. Thank you. All right, Ms. Williams. This one's very personal for me. I started out this year dealing with the terminal illness of my father. But the thing we had going for us was that we never had to make those decisions based on whether it was going to bankrupt our family because of Medicare. And I want every right, family to have that same freedom to do what is medically right. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't have a health care system in the United States. We have a sickness care system in the United States. Raise your hand if, gov if your government plan would provide coverage for undocumented immigrants. You cannot let people who are sick, no matter where they come from, no matter what their status, go uncovered. You can't do that. It's just going to be taken care of, period. You have to. It's a humane thing to do. But here's the deal. They, in fact, contribute to the well-being of the country, but they also, for example, they've increased the lifespan of Social Security because they're, they have a job, they're paying a Social Security tax. That's what they're doing. It's increased the lifespan. They would do the same thing in terms of reducing the overall cost of health care by them being able to be treated and not wait till they're an extremist. When we beat President Trump and Mitch McConnell walks into the over office, God forbid, to do negotiations, who do you want when that door closes to be sitting behind that desk to fight for women's rights? I have been the fiercest advocate Senator, for women's reproductive freedom Senator, for over fine. a decade. Thank and you. I promise you, as president, Senator when Harris. that door closes, I will guarantee okay. women's reproductive Senator, freedom Senator, no matter thank what. Thank you. Thank you.
As you just saw, the gloves were off tonight, but how many of those claims were true? NBC's Jane Tim is in Miami right now, where she's been fact-checking the candidates. Jane, what caught your eye tonight? Hey Morgan, tonight was definitely a much dicier night than last night. A lot of different facts flying, some of them right, some of them not right. One of the first things that jumped out at me was Senator Kamala Harris saying Democrats, you know, the economy isn't working for some people because people are working multiple jobs. This is something we hear a lot from the left because the economy looks pretty good and it's one of Trump's biggest claims for re-election. But the Bureau of Labor Statistics tracks how many people actually work multiple jobs. It's about 5% of America. That's 8 million people, so quite a lot of people. You can say there's a lot of people doing it, but it's actually down slightly from the last 20 years ago. A couple other things that jumped out at me. Mayor Pete Buttigieg talking about the pathway to citizenship, the fact that the vast majority of Americans actually support something, a kind of pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants. This is true. We have a Gallup poll that says 81% of Americans feel this way. A couple other things. A lot of people say Medicare for all doesn't abolish all private insurance. It does for everything but because medic care, which is not what most people think about for insurance purposes. The big one, of course, is Biden and busing. So Kamala Harris went straight after Biden for his talk, his, his support, opposition of busing years ago and how he, his policies and how he worked with segregationists. And this is true. She's careful in what she says, but Biden absolutely worked with avowed segregationists in order to oppose busing. His constituents opposed it and he opposed it. And it's one of the things that's really hitting him hard right now as he tries to say he can take the banner for his party in the 2020 election, but people in his party say that maybe he is not where the mainstream of the party is now. Which is interesting, Jane, because that's the moment that for every one of our panelists here, that really caught their eye. This question on busing and the fact that Senator Harris did hold his feet to the fire. So we definitely appreciate you clearing that up for us. Jane Tim, thanks for being with us live from Miami. Right now, we're going to take a very quick break, but we hope that you stay with us for special coverage of the first presidential Democratic debate right here on NBC News Now. Welcome back to NBC News Now. Let's go straight to our very own Dasha Burns, who's watching the debate tonight with a few college students from all across the country. Dasha, what stood out to the students tonight? Who do they think really captured their attention? Oh, man, it was a lively room in here tonight. A lot of hot takes, and I'm going to ask for them now. Guys, you, you had a lot to say while we were watching, and I, and I want those top-line reactions right now. What what stood out about the candidates, and, and what was your take on, on the debate overall tonight, especially compared with last night? Well, I think uh, Vice President Biden and Senator Sanders both buckled under the pressure of being frontrunners. You know, it seemed like when the heat really got turned up on them, they couldn't hold their own. And I think that that's pretty big of, you know, are they going to be able to last in this field? And, you know, for somebody like Vice President Biden, if, you know, Kamala Harris was pretty tough on him tonight, the president's going to be tough on him in a general election. Is he going to be able to handle that? Mm -hmm. Um, speaking of Kamala Harris, uh, I felt that even though tonight a lot of the candidates were able to come at Joe Biden for his controversial past, I think that Kamala was able to benefit uh, from people not checking up on her particular past mm -hmm. as she talked about um, her role in regards to prison reform and immigration. I feel like other candidates should have held her feet to the fire, just as they held um, Joe Biden um, to that standard as well. So that should be interesting to see uh, what's going to happen in the future. However, I do feel that she was able to make very strong um, quotes that are going to be headliners. And from that, people are going to be under the impression that she, quote unquote, won this debate. I, however, don't think so. Right. So you don't think people checked her enough. But the fact that that didn't happen, that she was able to hold Joe Biden's feet to the fire and no one came back at her. I mean, does right. that, does that, what does that say about her, her performance? Definitely very worrisome in, in that regard. Um, and especially, I'm going to keep going back to her statements about prison reform. She has a very controversial past about that. And the fact that nobody was able to bring that up and she was able to kind of paint the narrative of, uh, an individual that has always been fighting for these rights is uh, somewhat problematic to me. But did she resonate with you guys tonight? 
I definitely was really impressed by what she had to say tonight, and I feel like her current positions and the current things that she was saying really resonated with me. Um, but I definitely feel like what she really brought out of um, Joe Biden was like a lot of disappointment that I felt hearing about the fact that he kind of doubled down on that past position, and she was really able to make it seem, um, or at least to kind of bring out the the nasty racial tensions there, um, and the fact that he still kind of holds some of those old views today. So, yeah, I mean, it's, you guys, when I asked you about Joe Biden before the debate, I asked who was excited. Nobody raised their hands. Uh, what did what did his performance tonight do uh, to change your opinion of him? He was a distraction, I feel like, the entire debate, because uh, a lot of the candidates were just using their time to attack him and goad him. And then he spent all of his time basically defending himself, saying, oh, this is what I did. This is what I did. And he very rarely talked about what he actually planned to do. There wasn't a lot of substance with that. That's why I was more interested in some of the candidates like uh, Pete Buttigieg and uh, Andrew Yang, because they were just more focused on what they were actually planning to do. And even though they didn't get as many opportunities to speak as some of the headliners, they actually used their time to explain what they planned to do. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we talked about how you guys are interested in hearing substance. You're inter interested in hearing about policy. You talked about wanting a more civil discourse, trying to elevate the rhetoric. How did the candidates do with that tonight? And compare that to last night as well. I feel that was the most disappointing thing about tonight, that we did get to see some of their personalities, but we didn't really get to see their policies and mm -hmm. how they distinguish each of, each of themselves through their policy. That's what we didn't get to see, and that was the most disappointing, that I really don't know what their plan is going to be and how they set themselves apart from each other. And I think it's very clear what the candidates are against at this point, and that's what we mm -hmm. commonly heard. They're against Trump, they're against Wall Street. But what I liked about Kamala Harris and Pete Buttigieg in particular is they were very distinctly for something. Kamala Harris, for example, mm -hmm. laid out that plan to give a, a credit to people making below 100000 a year. That was really impressive. It kind of made her stand out as a advocate for the working and middle class. And that's more of what I want to see in these future Democratic debates. Did you guys get any clarity from tonight, and even from both nights, in terms of who you think will get your support and be able to last in this race? Mm -hmm. I think it's funny how tonight was supposed to be the night where individuals were supposed to be more excited, considering the big name candidates mm -hmm. uh, that were gathered together. But unfortunately, I personally believe that uh, yesterday's debate was a lot more based on actual policies that the candidates want to be able to focus on, uh, especially the conversations that we were all having before, and especially what you said. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, tonight, it was just all about Trump, 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 Trump. And again, it's like, yes, we already know what Trump is. We already know what Trump stands for. We get it. What are you going to do as an individual to help us? We are a younger generation that's not going to do what our parents did and just accept what you say to us. We want to make sure that when you get into office, you are going to stand by what you mean. All right. So night one actually seems like it won with you guys. <laughs> that, that, that took the cake. So who won from both nights? Let's start with you. No one. Oh, well, tonight, no one won. But yesterday, it was Julian uh, Castro. I think Julian won for both nights because he was actually to show his personality and also his policy. Um, I think Castro from last night, definitely. But Kamala Harris um, for tonight. But I would say overall, probably Castro would prevail. I think Secretary Castro stands out for wow. both nights. Lex? Uh, I thought Castro did stand out uh, during the last debate. I also thought Elizabeth Warren did a pretty good job. Pick uh, one between both nights. I, I liked Castro more just because I, I really wasn't uh, expecting anything out of him, I guess you could say, and he, he stood out. During this debate, again, I thought Pete Buttigieg did a great job, and I also thought in his limited time speaking, Andrew Yang did a good job. Mm -hmm. I actually think uh, Kamala Harris won both nights of the debate. I think she showed herself to be able to uh, battle another politician for uh, clearly uh, immoral policies in the past. I liked how she stood for something very clearly. Um, and I also liked that she was a very strong speaker. She asserted herself. Um, and that's something I want to see in a presidential candidate, especially when they take on Trump. Wow. OK, so still a pretty heavy vote for Castro, but uh, Kamala definitely got the spotlight tonight. There you have it.
Dasha. First debate's done, and we'll see how the rest go. <laughs> thank you so much, and thank you again to your panel of students. Something that Joy said really struck me. I want to bring in our guest again. Joy was the young woman in the front who said that Kamala didn't actually win because Kamala didn't get a dose of her own medicine. She turned and she questioned Senator, uh, former Vice President Biden, but no one actually did that to her, especially when it came to her record on her prosecution record in criminal justice. Is that true or false? Did she not win because she didn't have to take the heat herself? That, I mean, that might be true. Um, you know, I'm not very well versed in her prison reform issues. However, I really thought that she stole the show. I mean, I thought she came off very assertive, very confident. She answered every question with, you know, with, she was very direct and straightforward. I mean, I, I really did think that she, she came out on top, I walked away, I know personally, really having a better idea of where she stood on issues. What about Jackie, her criminal justice record? Yeah, I mean, she's received a lot of scrutiny for not being progressive enough. Um, she did, she was able to, I think, uh, exploit a few opportunities um, in order to tout her record as attorney general, for example, when she called out Biden um, on the Obama administration's track record with uh, in um, introducing family separation, um, which she said was the one policy of her former president that she was not in favor of. But that's the benefit of preparation. I mean, she, when you're on the offensive, you don't have to answer mm -hmm. for the things that people aren't attacking you for. And right. it was clear um, that this was something uh, attacking um, Biden on his opposition to busing was something that they had teed up. Uh, she went for it and she did not let up on mm -hmm. Biden. And um, that was a really big moment. That was the defining moment of the week. That's yeah. been the defining moment, I think, of this election so far. And, and she maybe, made it very personal. Uh, she did. Yeah. And, and what about Buttigieg, Nancy? Because, you know, when he was asked about why the police force back in South Bend was not very diverse, he said very plainly, I couldn't get it done. Was that refreshingly honest or was that enough? It was honest, but it was definitely not enough. You fell short. I mean, you gave me all of the reasons why I'm sure you've given all your constituents as to why it didn't get done. What you didn't give me is what will you do differently, right? You're gonna have to break this open. You can't walk in to this next stage of our presidency without being able to answer that question in a very concrete way. So you didn't get it done. Understood. There are a lot of things folks didn't get done. What's your plan to do it differently? Mm -hmm. I didn't hear that at all. Jackie, what did you think when Congressman Swalwell looked at him and said, well, then fire your police chief? Mm -hmm. And he didn't say anything. Right. Right. And I think that was really indicative of Mayor Pete's approach, uh, I think, to politics in general, right? Let's see the process play out. We're conducting an investigation. I'm not going to come to any rash decisions. Um, but I'm not necessarily sure that that's an answer that the public wants to see right now, especially in an era of our politics where things um, are pretty, uh, aren't necessarily rules based, um, at least in, in Trump's world. And I think if you're comparing him to someone like Julian Castro, uh, who yesterday really um, you know, got at uh, his criminal justice reform and his policing reform right. and was able to tout all of those policies. Mm -hmm. Mayor Pete wasn't able to, to show the same. And so to me, you know, the accountability is a step forward. It's a big contrast to someone like Biden. But then mm -hmm. when you you know, tee him up next to someone like Julian, who has a lot of experience um, as being mayor as well. And a well. lot of specifics. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's, you know, that's something when they're sitting next to each other at the next debate, it's, it's going to show. Well, one thing that we did hear some specifics on, he had very words, Mayor Pete, very strong words about China. He said, uh, China is using technology for the perfection of dictatorship. But did he really lay out a democratic alternative to dealing with China? No, not really. I mean, you heard you heard others mention um, the idea of rallying together with other foreign nations to push back against China to confront their behavior. Certainly, you heard um, the mention of, of intellectual property, um, which is you know the the real issue that they can rally all around pretty easily, especially globally. Um, but no, not specifics. I mean, I think with all of any foreign policy mentioned tonight, I didn't really hear much specifics in general. And what about when he talked about Nancy, the pathway to citizenship? He said there's a 11 million people waiting for a pathway to citizenship, but he said that the White House has divided us on a common ground issue. True or false? Well, I think the polls show that it's a common issue with a common kind of big end goal. We disagree in the details. We've been divided on this issue for a very long time, though. And so I think that one of the things that came up was the Obama record. Now, 
They called him the deportation chief, right? The deporter in chief. It wasn't family separation, it was deportations. So there's a little bit of a difference there in that what we're seeing now is so violently aggressive of children being taken from families and children dying. Very different. Yeah, I think people are very upset about something that they kind of in the big picture all agree on. But I think what's not being called out in all of these things from the criminal justice reform to the busing situation to immigration is that the big issue on the table is still around racial equity in this country mm -hmm. and nobody's calling it out nobody wants to talk about it for what it is it's the issue of racial equity and until we get comfortable about talking about it we're going to continue going around in circles and it's going to surface in different ways and in different policy issues but the uncomfort we saw for both Biden not knowing how to respond to the that was hurtful conversation to Buttigieg not being able to talk about I didn't get it done the, the kind of almost pulling back and not wanting to come back out at this. A it's reticence almost, to talk about exactly. it. Exactly. But, but did, did we see a reticence to talk about it? Because we saw someone even like Marianne Williamson came out very frankly and said, look, I don't think that America's actually racist, but I do think they are woefully undereducated on the issue of race. Like, and even the fact that Kamala said, no, wait a minute. I'm going to finish answering that question mm -hmm. because, oh, by the way, I'm the only person of color standing on this stage. Do you think they were more aggressive in addressing this issue tonight? Yeah, well, I mean, Marion Williamson went out of her way to bring up the issue of reparations, which has been a hot topic mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that was introduced by Kamala on the Breakfast Club um, 1051 interview at the beginning of the primary. And she said that it would be a way to address the systemic inequality um, that exists in America right now. And I think what was so effective about Kamala talking about it was her saying, having such a personal, so many personal anecdotes, you know, that vision and that tweet of her as a young girl being the victim of busing and saying that there were, she doesn't know anyone personally in her life, any African American male who hasn't been the target of um, racial discrimination or, or police profiling. Um, that to me was something that just really, really resonated. Which is interesting because on the same issue of reparations, you mentioned the Breakfast Club, every single candidate that's come on their show has been asked about this issue but even what the host of that show will say is that they've not heard any specifics you say you support this in right. theory but mm -hmm. what does that actually look like is that addressing issues exactly that affect right. the black community or is it an actual check more questions for us to discuss as soon as we <laughs> have to go to this break stay with us right here on NBC News now Last night, Democratic candidates held back just a little bit more when they were referencing President Trump. But tonight was a very different story. Let me tell you something. I, I hear that question, but where was that question when the Republicans and Donald Trump passed a tax bill that benefits the top 1%? The American people understand that Trump is a phony, that Trump is a pathological liar and a racist, and that he lied to the American people during his campaign. He said he was gonna stand up for working families. Well, President Trump, you're not standing up for working families when you try to throw 32 million people off the health care that they have, and that 83% of your tax benefits go to the top 1%. That's how we beat Trump. We expose him for the fraud that he is. What does Donald Trump do? He says, go back to where you came from. That is not reflective of our America and our values, and it's got to end. What President Trump has done is not only attack these children, not only demonize these immigrants, he is attacking a basic principle of America's moral core. We open our hearts to the stranger. But the worst thing President Trump has done is he's diverted the funds away from cross-border terrorism, cross-border human trafficking, drug trafficking, and gun trafficking, and he's given that money to the for-profit prisons. President Obama, I think, did a heck of a job to compare him to what, what this guy's doing is absolutely, I find, close to immoral. This president, though, for immigrants, there's nothing he will not do to separate a family, cage a child, or erase their existence. 
Well, one of the worst things about President Trump that he's done to this country is he's torn apart the moral fabric of who we are. When he started separating children at the border from their parents, the fact that seven children have died in his custody, the fact that dozens of children have been separated from their parents and they have no plan to reunite them. On day one, we take out our executive order pen and we rescind every damn thing on this issue that Trump has done. What is the greatest national security threat to the United States? It's Donald Trump. And I'm going to tell you why. And I'm going to tell you why. Because I agree, climate change represents an existential threat. He denies the science. You want to talk about North Korea? Real threat in terms of nuclear arsenal, but what does he do? He embraces Kim Jong-un, okay. a dictator for the sake of a photo Thank op. Thank so, Mr. President, if you're listening, I want you to hear me, please. You have harnessed fear for political purposes, and only love can cast that out. So I, sir, I have a feeling you know what you're doing. I'm going to harness love for political purposes. I will meet you on that field, and sir, love will win. So for some final thoughts, let's get right back to our panel. Sure, Michael, Alex, and Lena are here for more. Was it strategic and was it smart to make Trump more of the focus tonight? Well, Trump certainly enjoyed it. He was live tweeting this time. He didn't say it was boring this time. And you saw him really go after the Democrats for their positions on providing health care to undocumented immigrants and crossing the border. What did you think, Zerlina? I mean, I think that they needed to talk about Trump tonight. I think that that was missing from last night. And you need to talk about Donald Trump because nothing about this moment is normal. I think it's good to show that the Democrats can be the post-Trump leaders of the future, but we need to talk about the existential threat that Donald Trump poses to the country. What did you think, Sher Michael? Did you feel like this tonight just gave Donald Trump more fodder because of the division? I mean, look, I, I think when you think about this thing, if I'm a Democrat, I'm concerned about a couple things here. Who can beat Donald Trump in the states where it matters? So if you look at Pennsylvania, Trump beat Hillary Clinton by 44,000 votes. He beat Hillary Clinton in Michigan by 10,000 votes. He beat Hillary Clinton in Wisconsin by 22,000 votes, and in Florida by 100,000 votes. Those are not drastically wide margins that are unbeatable. So my question is, if I'm going to make this case that if I am a Democrat that I can beat this guy, how can I make up those margins? That has to be the fundamental question when you're thinking about electoral politics. But it wasn't just about focusing on Donald Trump because it was also about focusing on each other. And then right. we saw kind of a similar tactic yeah. tonight that we saw last night where these guys who were polling in the single digits on the ends of the stage were coming for the guys who were standing in the center of the stage. We saw Swalwell go for Biden, Bennett go for Bernie. Was that, did that work? I think so. I mean, otherwise, were you going to remember who is at the end of the stage? I mean, I'm not even making that as a joke. I think there are a lot of candidates on stage, and sometimes it's hard to keep track with where each one stands on the issues. But I think, you know, in order to stand out on a stage of 10 people, you have to go after the guy who's in charge. I mean, you're running for president. This isn't, you're not running, you know, just to be there. There's one just, office. Ah, yeah, one office. And I think, you know, going back to the, the, the thing I said earlier about Kamala Harris, I mean, I think it's important to show up and act like you're there to be president. You're not running to be vice president. You're not running just to up your name recognition. You're actually running to do the job. And I think that going after Biden directly shows that you're willing to take on somebody who has been a vice president. But, but was it effective, Alex? Well, so I don't think anyone stood out as much as Secretary Castro did last night. I think you yes. saw Michael Bennett. You saw John Hickenlooper. You saw Eric Swalwell go after Mayor Pete briefly. Not even Senator Harris tonight. Not as much as Julian Castro. Oh, no, Secretary Harris, but I consider her in a different tier than Secretary Castro. You, I was talking about, like, sort of the lesser tier ah, going after the big candidates. It. Kamala clearly is in a league of her own it, with this it. debate. But, no, you know, Michael Bennett, all these lower tier candidates, I don't think they really did anything to help their candidacies to qualify for the third and fourth round of debates. But the truth is a lot of people who are watching these debates are tuned in and they're curious. Was there anything that you heard tonight that would really jazz up those people who stayed home back in 2016? I'm going to be honest. It's not yet, but it's early, right? I mean, th there are so many debates to come. Uh, candidates have to continue to build out those operational infrastructures. I don't think we pay a lot of attention to this. Mm. Debate performances are great, but are you actually laying that foundation, which is how you target, how you mobilize a constituency that propels you on to a victory? Mm. And it's too early to sort of predict this yet.
Yeah, they're very yeah. focused on the progressive voters, and the question is, by taking these progressive stances, will it make it harder to appeal right. to those well, voters in the general? It, mm -hmm. and, and the question yeah. is, though, will it work? We're going to have a hard break here yes, in yes. just a moment. I want to thank each of you for coming in tonight, and even those who aren't sitting on the couch right now, Alex, Jackie, Sher, Michael, Hagar, Nancy, Zerlina, Dasha, and all of those students, and of course, all of you at home. Thank you so much for watching the past two nights of the first presidential Democratic debates. Thanks for tuning in to NBC news now and don't miss the main event don't go anywhere because we're going to replay night two of the first democratic debate just coming up next otherwise tune in tomorrow at 3 p.m eastern for more on nbc news now i'm morgan radford thank you so much for spending your evening with us